This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to talk about using Bitcoin block space more efficiently and why this is important and how you can do it. This is a follow-up to yesterday's video about how monetary systems actually scale in which we looked at how a monetary system would look on the gold standard, on the fiat standard, and on a Bitcoin standard as well. And what we concluded is that money always scales in layers and most daily economic activity will take place at higher layers or different payment rails then this economic activity, all these different transactions will be batched up together, netted out with the net result being settled to the base layer. The base layer offers stronger final settlement guarantees than higher layers, but usually comes with higher transaction fees. And if none of that makes sense to you, make sure you watch that video, which I'll link to in the description notes below. The way this worked on a practical level in the gold standard was something like this. The US and Germany would send goods back and forth. And then at the end of the year, let's say they would settle up by sending physical gold by boat or airplane. This is obviously a gross simplification, but this is the general principle. So if the US bought $100 million worth of goods from Germany and Germany bought $90 million worth of goods from the US, at the end of the year, the US would send one boat then with $10 million worth of physical gold to Germany rather than wasting time and money shipping $100 million worth of gold to Germany from the US and then $90 million worth of gold from Germany to the US. So instead you batched up these transactions, you netted them out and sent one $10 million payment. And this is how the settlement system worked and gold was a settlement layer. That's how the monetary system works on a gold standard. On a Bitcoin standard, you would do something similar. Most economic activity takes place on higher layers and then would be batched up, netted out and settled to the base layer, which is the Bitcoin blockchain. These would be on chain layer one transactions. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to subscribe, like, comment, and share. So let's say that my friend and I like to send money back and forth to each other all year long. We like to send Bitcoin back and forth. We buy things from each other. We settle bets, etc. Rather than doing all this on chain on Bitcoin on the base layer, like we used to do, today we could open up a lightning channel between us. This would involve a single transaction on the base layer in which we locked up some Bitcoin in a two of two multisig in order to make it available for use in that lightning channel. So you're not printing up more money, you're locking up an equal amount of Bitcoin on the base layer that you'll be using in that lightning payment channel. And then once we had this payment channel set up between us, we could pay each other back and forth as much as we liked. We could do a thousand transactions back and forth and it would be essentially free. And then at the end of the year, maybe we'd close the, the channel, settle up on chain using another two of two multi-sig transaction that would undo the first transaction. And this would net out those thousands and thousands of transactions. And basically we would settle up who owes the other what. So we did a thousand transactions off chain in our lightning channel, and then we settled on chain using just two transactions. This is one way the block space gets used more efficiently. So why might we do this? Well, we might do this because on-chain transaction fees are currently too high for it to make any economic sense for us to do a thousand transactions between us on-chain. Maybe in 2016 or 2015, we did a lot of on-chain transactions, but today with transaction fees being higher, we choose to do this using a lightning, lightning payment channel instead. The general principle here is higher on-chain fees drive transactions to layer two solutions like Lightning. Or if you don't want to think in terms of layers, you can just think in terms of different payment rails. This payment channel between myself and my friend would be fairly self-sovereign. No one can stop us from transacting with each other. Now you could also replace my friend and me with two businesses sending, sending money back and forth across a Lightning channel to Bitcoin or crypto exchanges sending Bitcoin back and forth, etc. Sending Bitcoin back and forth to each other while having a minimal impact on chain. This is obviously a highly simplified version of how the Lightning Network works in practice. It, in practice, it's an interlocking series of channels and not all channels connect to one another and their liquidity issues, etc. But this is just a gross simplification of how higher layers can help to batch up transactions and then only settle them on chain occasionally and thus use on chain more efficiently. Here's a more custodial example. Let's say Cash App customers send Bitcoin back and forth to each other. And these, you need to open up an account with Cash App, 
Cash App in order to do this. Cash App then maintains an internal spreadsheet that looks something like this, a very simplified version. Alice has a half a Bitcoin. Harry has half a Bitcoin. Then Harry sends Alice a quarter of a Bitcoin. So Alice has 0.75 Bitcoin. Harry has 0.25. And then it gets sent back. Now they have equal amounts of Bitcoin, etc., etc. At the end of these transactions, Alice ends up with one Bitcoin. Harry ends up with zero Bitcoin. So you've had how many transactions? Uh, five or six transactions. Now Alice withdraws from Cash App using Lightning. This probably has zero impact on chain. She ends up with this one Bitcoin in her Lightning wallet. That would be an example of a withdrawal using the Lightning network. Or Alice could ask Cash App to send her the Bitcoin on chain using an on chain withdrawal, providing a Bitcoin like a BC1 Bitcoin address, for example. This would involve one transaction on chain. And so by maintaining an internal spreadsheet of multiple transactions between Alice and Harry and only settling on chain at the end, block space was used much more efficiently and transaction fees were lower for everyone involved. They were lower for Harry and Alice who could send Bitcoin back and forth to each other on Cash App probably for no fee. And fees were ultimately lower as well for Cash App because they did not have to do all these on-chain transactions. They just did one Lightning Network transaction or one on-chain transaction at the end. What's the biggest problem with this? Obviously it's custodial Bitcoin. Cash App could be ordered by the US government not to allow Alice to withdraw her one Bitcoin, and there's nothing that Alice could do about it. Or Cash App could pretend to have enough Bitcoin so that every customer can withdraw. Then you get a bank run on Cash App, and there's not enough Bitcoin for every customer to go around to get what they thought they were owed. What's the market solution to this problem? Well, the initial solution is maybe you store most of your Bitcoin in cold storage, and then you just leave a little bit on Cash App or Strike or one of these other companies to transact with people with. But most of your Bitcoin is in cold storage. And so if the government freezes Cash App or Cash App runs off with your Bitcoin, maybe you have a couple hundred dollars there, whereas you have thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin in cold storage. So this would be a way to transact a lot in Bitcoin and not pay a lot of transaction fees. It does come with these custodial risks. One of the market solutions to this custodial risk problem is that companies that want to stay in business will keep enough Bitcoin on hand for their customers. Companies that don't will end up going bankrupt like BlockFi and FTX. And unfortunately, they'll take down the innocent at the same time. But this would be a market way of voting on who you trust. Do you trust Cash App, a very professionally run company, or do you trust BlockFi, which was a complete mess. It's not a perfect solution, but this could give the consumer many different choices. You could ask yourself at some point in time for your couple hundred dollars of spending Bitcoin. Do you trust Cash App or Coinbase or Apple or Google, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs? Which do you trust more to hold your Bitcoin? So in this video, we've looked at really two solutions to the scaling problem, two very simplified solutions. One of them, the first one was much more self-sovereign and self-custodial. This was the lightning payment channel between my friend and me. The second was less self-sovereign and highly custodial. This was a cash app keeping an internal, an internal uh, spreadsheet. Higher transaction fees incentivize people to reduce their on-chain footprint as well. And there are different ways of doing this. They can do it by using higher layers or different payment rails, as we've been discussing, like Lightning or custodians like Cash App. Higher transaction fees also incentivize people to reduce their on-chain footprint by making them wait to make on-chain transactions until congestion is lower and fees are lower. So maybe you would normally conduct a transaction using the Bitcoin network on Monday morning at 9 a.m., but there's just too much activity. And so maybe instead you do your transaction Sunday night at 11 o'clock at night. This is similar to taking a red-eye flight in order to save money on an airplane ticket rather than flying at a prime commute time. Higher transaction fees also incentivize people to reduce their on-chain footprint by using block space more efficiently, by batching transactions and using newer address types. So the more you use on-chain Bitcoin and the more block space you take up when you use that on-chain Bitcoin, the more you end up paying in transaction fees. So what are some ways to reduce your on-chain footprint and for the entire ecosystem to reduce its on-chain footprint? One way is of course to do one transaction with 10 outputs rather than 10 transactions each with only one output. So for example, in the old days, the crypto exchanges or the Bitcoin exchanges would send out multiple withdrawals. And then sometime about five or six years ago, they started batching up transactions. So they would have 
one input on their side or just one or two inputs on their side, and then maybe 10 or 100 or 1,000 outputs on the other side as they sent out Bitcoin to customers who were requesting withdrawals. We can see a little bit how this works using this transaction size calculator. We're gonna use a transaction type called pay to public key hash. We're gonna have one input and one output. This takes up 192 V bytes of block space. And so that's if you're just doing one input and one output. But let's say we do uh, 10 outputs instead. So rather than sending 10 separate separate withdrawals we just send one withdrawal from the exchange with 10 outputs so rather than it costing 192 v bytes you'd expect it would cost 10 times as much but it's actually much more efficient if we check here we'll see it only costs 498 v bytes so this is one way of saving on block space which also helps you helps the exchange helps whoever is sending this to save on Bitcoin fees. So that'd be one way you batch up transactions and you have multiple outputs. Another way to reduce your on-chain footprint would just be to use a newer address type that takes up less block space. We can use the same transaction size calculator to see that if we're using pay to public key hash address transaction type and we have one input, one output, again, it will be 192 V bytes worth of space. But if we use a newer address type like Taproot, this will drop down to 111 V bytes worth of space. So this is yet another way that you can ease online congestion and in the process, save yourself Bitcoin transaction fees. And these are various ways in which Bitcoin becomes more efficient at the base layer and also encourages usage at higher layers and using different payment rails, custodial and non-custodial and self custodial. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.